and welcome to um, May the Fourths be with you today. Uh, we have Mayor Mike Smith with us. Hello, Mike. <laughs> oh. <laughs> exactly. I couldn't resist it. It was one of those things um, that I just had to. I mean, I, I, only, I only thought the last minute. I was a bit like, oh no, I forgot to bring that over. So I did that. But um, I need to shorten it. it was one of, uh, I did let a couple of people see it and they said, oh, you need to shorten it a bit. It's a bit long. Um, maybe I need it to pan out. So, um, yeah. Oh, all good things. Right. Um, I suppose one th one thing we should really go with um, first thing is I haven't seen you for over a week now on this wonderful screen. So how are you? Yes, exactly. It's um, it's one of those unfortunate things where you're stuck inside, but at the end of the day, you're staying safe, and obviously no pressure on the NHS. That's the main thing. Um, the cooking. I mean, my cats have had me around for ages, and they keep on jumping up on the table now, and especially when I'm trying to do stuff, it's like they got so used to things, and it's just become a normality to me. Usually, cats stay away. You see, until they get used to something, then they go, "Oh, I'll get involved." So if, if my flow flow does pop up, obviously because I'm at home, um, I do apologise, and it's not very professional, but there's not much I can do about cats. <laughs> um, shall we have a look at the numbers? Shall we, um, as what they put out today? I mean, the numbers are scrolling around at the bottom of the screen. Um, I've taken that from the BBC site, which is as of yesterday. Um, the thing is, I'm always trying to find the link for the information. So I'll, it will get rid of you, but I'll bring you straight back. We'll be able to hear you anyway. So let's just do mm -hmm. that. So, uh, I mean, obviously the government was going on about the five tests, which um, we have to kind of tick before we um, remove ourselves from lockdown. Um, sufficient capacity to provide critical care, obviously, sustain a consistent fall in the daily numbers, reliable data to show that the rate of infection is decreasing to manageable levels across the board, operational challenges, including testing out for CPPU, which is a big thing that happened, obviously, in the press over the last week about the PPE and the panorama thing um, and comment that any adjustments to the current measures will not risk a second peak. Now the second peak is something that we, we will obviously talk about. Um, let's have a look here. The numbers obviously driving's up a bit. They're a bit worried about that. What was your mm. what was your thing on that about the, about the driving? Yeah, I think it's been um, getting busy, not busy compared to what we used to, but since the lockdown started, I think the weekend was about the uh, the busiest time on the roads in general, and uh, some of that may well be legitimate reasons, but then you hear news stories about people driving from Kent to Cornwall for a, a quick weekend away, which clearly isn't a necessary journey, and yeah, we, we still need to... Uh, be quite tough on things like that. I think we do. Um, driving quite far away is is not on. I mean, it's if you break down, you're, you're putting the breakdown services in harm's way as well. I covered this a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks, about three or four, such a long time ago, I think five weeks ago now, actually, um, where the AA guy I was speaking to, I broke down, my petrol pipe had gone off, whatever. Um, and he said most of the cases he dealt with were actually... Well, if anything, none of them were key workers or, you know, the NHS or care workers. And mm -hmm. That's a very worrying point of view. I mean, he's thinking, I'm going to go out there and make sure that we get, you know, our frontline staff to their place of work or, you know, make sure and recover them safely. And mostly he's dealing with people on a day trip, which is, and of course, mm -hmm. I was delivering food. I was being, you know, a nice person and delivering food. I wasn't on a jolly. I'd just like to stress that. Um, but it is a weird one, isn't it? it? It's people shooting off down wherever they want to go, like an hour drive for a five-minute walk in the countryside is not on. No, they've the relaxed things a bit on that. You can, I think you can take a short drive to go for a long walk, but certainly not the other way around. That's definitely been the drive from the government. I think they've said that in a quite a few press conferences. 
Um, yeah. Okay, let's move on to the. Um, make sure I still got your sound. Yes, I have. Um, obviously, daily tests. So, I mean, they hit their hundred thousand mark. Did you find that a surprise, or are you a bit like, hmm? What was your um, on that one? I have to say, I'm a bit skeptical about that. I think up to now. The politicians on different sides have been working together and singing from the same hymn sheet, but there was to be so short of their target with a couple of days to spare, then suddenly not just hit it, but smash it, and then drop back under it for the following couple of days, suggests, yeah, a bit of jiggly pokery. And then when you hear that actually the number of tests counted was those that have been sent out, not those that have been completed and got a result, which most of us would say what we understand to be a test is a test that's been carried out and the person's got a result, the health service has got a result that it can act on. And also where people were required to have two tests for whatever reason, that counted as two rather than one. I would say it should be the number of people that have been tested that really is important. So, um, yeah, a bit disappointed by that. I'd rather the government said, we set an ambitious target. We got close to it, but we didn't quite get there. And that's because things are quite difficult to do at the moment. But we'll keep trying. It just felt a bit a bit like old style politics, a bit a bit of spin going on there, which I don't like to see. Yeah, in, in these times, it's a bit unfortunate. I mean, I, I'm on the, under the same idea, you know, how can you all of a sudden go whoop and then boom, you know, it, mm, not good. And it's a shame because in this moment of crisis, we would have thought they're trying, I mean, they keep on saying they're trying to be as transparent as they can be. Mm. And then they do that. It's a, Bit. I mean, the PPE thing with the panorama, that was an interesting one. I covered off of, um, I nearly said Mike Smith, not you, um, with Greg Smith. And there's a lot of Smiths around at the moment. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I said about the HCI, I don't know way before the panorama thing. Um, and I see, you know, anything else or reasons why it was moved from a HCID to a, uh, an IPC. And he just said it was mortality rate, which that's everything I found to be fair. But um, panorama picked on that and carried it through with PPE and I think if they would have been up front to say look we hadn't done this we haven't done that nobody would have they would have understood I think cost cutting in the NHS is something that the Conservatives do um, and you know it's one of those things anybody would do I suppose if they got to save money in somewhere along the lines and gowns and masks mm -hmm. nobody could have predicted this was going to happen unless you're um, somebody who works in the antibody area who, who starred on like Centivax and Jacob um, Glanville you know and they said the, the pandemic there will be one but um, mm. really it's a bit it's, it's a bit of a weird one when you think be up front with the people stop doing the cloak and dagger and you'll be respected more but that's part I agree of with you Martin yeah yeah um, let's have a look let's move on quickly um, because I thank you for your time as well obviously um, <laughs> We had new cases. Um, again, that's how many they've done and how many. Um, I mean, I mean the testing. I mean, it's, we're at a few hundred thousand now, aren't we? Obviously, of how many people have been tested. Um, mm -hmm. really, we're at what four thousand. Um, we also got right. This is obviously the the numbers in the hospital or people in the hospital. That's gone down, and the southeast is. Yep, definitely on the on the way down as well, which is good news to hear. Um, I don't know what's this bit. Here we go. Our critical care beds, obviously that's increasing, except for in Northern Ireland, that seems to be going up. So seems to be a problem there in Northern Ireland. Mm, but it is one of those things when you see it going up in one area, not in another, where you think, what's going on? You know, why is that spreading? Are, are, is it are people not taking thought of the distancing rules for instance could be could be just the chance factors at play um, the way society is organized may, may play a part um, so we had the the very 
quick climb towards a peak in London compared to everywhere else, but also a much more rapid drop, whereas the, the, the curve has been a little bit flatter in, in other places and uh, lagging behind, if you like, the, the, the peak being reached and, and then the, the downward curve. Uh, it's the kind of thing where we kind of know how pandemics work in a very general sense, but this one in particular is clearly very different to anything we've faced in recent years. And uh, there's there's little bits of guesswork involved and we don't get everything right. Yeah. I mean, how can you get anything totally right? I mean, it is a, I mean, since 1918 was the last massive pandemic. Mm -hmm. So how can you get it right? I'm trying to be fair and keep my book open and... You know, not trying to be biased in one way or the other and trying to see how things can be and could we have foreseen I mean if, unless you watch Pandemic on Netflix you probably wouldn't even it wouldn't even be on your radar and after a certain amount of time mm -hmm. watching that sort of thing it definitely fades off um, yeah it's, it's, it's a weird one I tell you what I did notice just looking at those figures is um, the North East in Yorkshire as well I mean they went above London oh yeah they went above London and now they're on the decline now, which is good to hear. But is that people going to their second home or a holiday home? It's an interesting one, that. I think there was there was a lot going on about that on the news the other day. Mm -hmm. People doing that. I mean, the Isle of Wight have now got their... Or will be going live with the, the track and trace. Um, and they were saying about, are they going to lift, um, you know, lockdown for them? And they said no. But um, they did say that they've... You know, the, the the ferry companies are really working hard to make sure that people aren't just coming over in, into their holiday homes because obviously there's quite a few over there in caravans, mm -hmm. people trying to get away. So, well, we're going to self isolate in our caravan or in our nice holiday home. So it's good that they're doing that as well. But um, that's what's the last slide that the government had? I can't remember. Oh, it's the curve, obviously. Uh, sorry, got a bit quick there. Seven day rolling average. Um, yeah, it's. What's under 600, is it? It looks like. Oh, just above 600. Which is. Yeah, I mean, but, but still fluctuating from day to day. And uh, yeah. always get that dip at the weekend and then picking up during the week. And if you look towards the middle and end of last week, there were still days where there were six and 700 cases a day. And that's six, 700 yeah. deaths, families being affected. Yeah, Hundreds of people dying that wouldn't have died if it were, if this virus wasn't about, and that really brings it home that it's still something we need to be very concerned about. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It, it, very, very well noticed. Maybe it's the counting in you, but yes, yeah, it's <laughs> the, the, there is that thing about the weekend. And I've worked in the in the public sector for for a hospital, and I do know that on the weekends the clerks aren't there, and they deal with it when they come back. So obviously there's a there's a catch up as well. So mm. the, the, it may take like forty eight hours. So you're talking about the Tuesday, or maybe the wet. So obviously for reporting reasons, probably the Wednesday before the real figures from the weekend come in, which is um, in the, at this port. Of, you know, at this time, uh, is the hospital going to make people come in extra just to, for those reporting figures? I don't know. Or maybe, I mean, for that for now it doesn't really matter. But I suppose if those numbers kept on climbing, I suppose that would be a very important thing maybe that they would need to keep well on top to to see what they could do indeed yeah so uh the last one um oof, united states still going up it looks like we're kind of hitting that flat line there it's showing all settings we've gone above italy spain and france um which is quite sad isn't it really um uh yeah it is and I suppose questions will need to be asked at some point. Was our response the right one? Was it quick enough? But for me, the important question now is, is not what have we done so far and was it right or was it wrong, but what do we do next to keep it under control and keep that curve on the, uh, on the, on the downward side? Yeah, I mean, the, the lockdown measures obviously are, are, are working and people are most or a very vast majority of people are staying within their confines of their home and only going out for emergency well you know um not emergency reasons but you know 
priority reasons for like shopping. It, it is an interesting one. Once the, I, I do find it pretty interesting that there's a lot going on, especially from the press about reopening up. And the government is fending back by saying, not at the moment, not at the moment. But I do think they're, they're feeling pressure to lift the lockdown so they're so people are happy so to speak or the press is going to be happy I, I, that's what I'm seeing yeah there's quite a lot uh, on the TV the little bit that I caught today about workplaces opening up again and public transport but still with social distancing um, and I think there's probably a lot of pressure, particularly from the press, saying, well, people have put up with this for six, seven weeks now. Cut them some slack. Give them a bit of opportunity to to be a bit more normal again. But it's got to be driven by the science. If that's not the right thing to do, however good it feels for a while, if that leads to a second peak or more, more deaths than there need to be, then that will prove to be the wrong decision. And it's very hard to get that across to people when they're feeling frustrated and bored by everything and wanting to see other people. But by all means, if the science says you can do that and other measures that you keep in place will keep it under control, I'll be delighted to see that. But I want it to be scientific rather than politically driven or driven by the media's agenda. Um totally agree I mean driving stuff I mean political powers and obviously media they tie up so well that I do I do really have that worry and scientific is the way to go without a doubt just let things settle let things go down I mean the numbers are going down so why with this sudden push to to do this it's, it's wrong I personally think and it sounds like you do too I mean it's interesting what you said about for instance, last time we chatted was the tip opening. So it seems like after our chats, the government, I think, plays with our thoughts and our chats and they come up with new ideas, like the cemetery was one of them. And now the tip, they're talking about opening up the tips, which will be um, very interesting so that people can actually get... I think they copied exactly what you said the other week, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I won't claim credit for that, if credit is the right word, but clearly that, that message is coming through that... Uh, and I think in Buckinghamshire, they're talking about reopening five of the waste sites, yeah. not all of them. Obviously, I think they'd struggle to fully staff them and maintain social distancing. So uh, I believe they're, they're waiting for some sort of final directive from government to say, you can do this. And I think it's going to be next week, possibly end of this week that a number of them will be reopening and I'm sure that will be good news for quite a few people who had plenty of time to clear out their loft and clear out their garden and got stuff to get rid of and I'm glad that people are holding on to it and waiting for the tip to reopen rather than fly tipping and we know a lot of that's happening I've seen some horrifying pictures of really beautiful spots in rural Wales with lorry loads of stuff that's just been taken and dumped really? uh, which is I've not seen that. that's wrong so wrong but mm -hmm. uh, again with the the chart I mean this is something I will cover off at some other point but the charging of the tip I know that a lot of people spoke to me about that and they are not happy that they have to pay and it was obviously it's going to cause this idea of people fly tipping um, it Again, it's the minority who go through and don't, you know, go through the commercial channels. They'll, you know, they'll clean out somebody's house and then they'll, they'll go right. I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, they get paid to say fifty pound, you know, extra to mm -hmm. to obviously get rid of the rubbish correctly, and they don't. They just fly tip it. Um, but in this case, they were going to the council, I believe, you know, normal household recycling plant, not you know, and not in a work van, and then they were obviously tipping. I think that's another reason that council done what they did but it's still it's a bit like unfair i think on the people because they, they pay the council tax and then they have now got to pay to get rid of their their stuff that's what i'm hearing from a lot of people they're not happy about that but i don't think anyone was happy about that well aside from 
the political party that runs the county council, but we won't get into the politics of it. But I think the, the worry was that, um, yes, they needed to save money in their budget, and this was a short-term saving, but the long-term costs will come back to bite them because clearing up fly tipping, pursuing prosecutions of people, um, that all costs money. And I, I don't condone fly tipping. No, there's no excuse to go out and commit a crime as well it's, it's a crime and an environmental crime as well it's a crime against but the environment it's the something biggest. that's something that's going to happen and the cost is is not worth the short-term savings so i yeah very much hope for a rethink on on all of that maybe once the um stats come in or the financial figures maybe that's something i could look into and maybe chat to a few people about Again, it's still after Martin Tet. I will get him at one point. <laughs> I think um, right. he could give you answers to a lot of, a lot of questions like that. Well, well, he may not give you answers, but I think he's the person to ask those questions. That's why I want to get him on here. <laughs> but he doesn't sit well. I left it with their team. They said they'll get back to me, but they, they still haven't. And I have been pursuing quite a, a few other avenues on stuff that's outside of this county i'm afraid it's all around around the world so i've been really mm. busy um what else have i got down on my list of things um first of all do you know the numbers for buckinghamshire um going back to the sad stats of um of deaths i mean i have down as coming up on the screen now as of the third of may because i've got my figures from yesterday was 845 cases in buckinghamshire 2465 have died in the southeast, but mm -hmm. how many have died in the Buckinghamshire area? Do you, is there a update to that? I've seen various figures on that. Um, I think at some point last week, I saw a figure of sixty something deaths in Bucks. Um, but it, just today, I think the but the well, in the last couple of days, I saw it today. The Bucks Herald had some figures which said that in the Aylesbury Vale area. There have been 45 deaths with coronavirus as the cause or quoted on the death certificate. So that would suggest that there are more deaths in Aylesbury Vale than in other parts of Bucks, which is um, would be very sad if, if that was the case. So definitely wear a mask, I would think, after our last chat a couple of weeks ago. So that also brings me back to that, actually. Did you... Um did you do that? Did you make a mask? I haven't made one yet, no. I've, um, I've, I've been watching various YouTube videos about making masks out of socks and other pieces of cloth that you're going to have around the house, but I haven't actually... Ah. <laughs> Very fetching indeed. Yes, I did make one. I used to made a little video as well about it. So I thought, um, there you go, that will win me the prize. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought I might go shopping with that one. So, uh, <laughs> hmm. so, so you, you looked at a few videos and um, did you watch the Surgeon General from uh, the US, the one that I put up on there? Yeah, yeah, I did see that, yeah. So um, I, I'm still in two minds about masks and whether they are effective in terms of, well, they, if you've got coronavirus, they're effective in stopping you passing, passing it on. If you haven't, it's less clear as to whether they are a, a defence. and and social distancing and all the other measures are far more effective. So, as, as I think we've said before, the worry is that people put a mask on, they go out, think, I'm protected, and then maybe don't keep the distance as, as much as they should, and that uh, you know that leads to it being counterproductive. But so I'm, that... I'm still willing to listen to the, the different aspects of this. I've been... Um following Dr. Jacob Glanville of um, Distributed Bio. I've been trying to get a interview with him. I mean, they've got um, a cure, so to speak. Um, 
which is interesting. But he had a little conversation with regards to um, wearing a mask. You know, he was asked this question in one of his interviews that was, you know, would you recommend a mask? And he, and he actually came back with, actually, yes. And he said this reasons why, A, it reduces the distance and obviously protects you a little bit. Um, it reduces, you know, the transmission distance. But also, it, it the biggest problem you've got with a virus is touching your face. We are so... If you, especially when you when you record yourself, like especially on wonderful interviews like this, you start to see that you touch yourself and quite... Oh, yeah. Uh, hit myself. Mm. Yeah. And he said... Having a mask on actually stops you from doing. Yes, you can be complacent, mm. as in, you know, you, I'm okay. I'm wearing a mask, but actually, from touching yourself, it can actually reduce. Because obviously, you have to touch the mask, and then you, f you either throw or wash the mask, whatever, depending on what, what sort of uh, mask you have, and then you wash your hands. So actually, you've actually stopped directly touching your face because it, mm. actually, it does actually work. So interesting that different people are saying different. I mean. Our UK government, you know, doctors are saying, oh, they don't think it really helps that much. And a lot of the outside world are saying different. They are saying, mm. wear masks. Um, you know, it does protect, it does reduce the distance. And I mean, we talked about this a month ago. I mean, when I first brought it to your attention, you know, and I said about it and creating these masks are again we don't want to stop the nhs especially after the panorama thing getting their ppe i mean i'll say care workers as well because um, i've had a quite a few conversations with people who work in the private care sector and i say we say it's private should we be under nhs but that's another story but they do need their protection i mean they are literally they don't even know whether a person has covid and it you know buying up a whole load of PPE. I mean, it's not even cheap on Amazon or whatever there is out there um, that people may look for. But I, you know, personally, I wear my mask to protect everybody else. I know that the chance of me being protected is pretty much negligent. But um, if I cough, sneeze, or whatever, it will not um, go as far. And there was an interesting. Mm -hmm. There is an interesting video out there that came out of this um, next topic um, discussion that had a whole lot of scientists that I watched the other day, which was about seven, eight hours long. And they, they said about this video that I, I found while watching this, um, this talk thing. And it is scary how much actually travels around a room. And after watching that, it does make, when somebody sneezes, coughs. I mean, one of the things is when you're wearing a mask as well, may I just state, is you cough into your elbow even if you're wearing a mask because that that's you know it has more push and that reduces it but this this video i watched mm. it, it will make you think when you walk into a room and somebody sneezes even if it's at the other end how it just goes round it's it, it's pretty scary really i, I might put okay. it at some point <laughs> mm, yeah. sorry sorry <laughs> Definitely not something to watch before you have your dinner, or maybe after. Give it a good couple of hours. Um, so you did. So anyway, well, well, maybe next time you can have your face. You can do your face mask. Now that I proved that I'd done my one, I also did another one. By the way, I actually used half the fabric and created a nice little FBL one, um, which did seem to fit better. Um, I did do a little video as well. Did you want to see a little bit of the video? <laughs> you probably don't. Want. Um, Let's have a look. What else? Do you want to see a little bit of the video? I sent it out. Yeah. Or maybe it, you sure? Oh, okay. It might be a little bit slow because it all uses the same hard drive. Let's see if it will work. US General Surgeon, or Surgeon General, sorry. If it does play. Sets out. Oh, you should see a video about oh doesn't want to play. There we go. Ah, <laughs> oh, live technology. I think it's because it all sits on the same hard drive. That was a bit, bit of a sad one. Um, I'd like to go on to the Ellsbury Food Bank. Um... Did you know if they got their vehicle? Or I mean, I was going to contact I them. I don't think they have, but thanks for your help in publicising that. As as it happens, I went there today to drop off some food donations and a and a, a cash donation as well. Um, and I think they're still using their little van that they had before. So uh, it would be it would really increase the reach of their service if they could get hold of. 
three-seater van, ideally on a permanent basis, um, and um, if not on a loan basis for the time being. So, um, you know, just anyone out there who's got a van they're not using at the moment, um, please get in touch with the food bank. Okay, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So maybe I can push something else out there to try and help. Um, that is really sad. Um, maybe I need to get the, the the Frankie the camper van up and running so that I can actually go there and do a do a video session and try and publicise it. Or maybe to, I'll just get them on here. Maybe that's a safer thing with social distancing. I don't know if the law is the same for um, companies that broadcast, whether or not we don't have to actually stick to the adherence of staying at home. Um, but I do have the technology now to get out there, or nearly have. Um, right, we have also youth concern. How's that getting on? Um, they obviously had issues uh, last time, obviously because of the social distancing and. Uh, have yeah, I know that they're they're still providing their service through social media and email and um, phone counselling. Um, and there's um, as much need as ever young people particularly suffering mental health difficulties it's happening more and more with lockdown and just the disruption to lifestyle so uh, they are continuing to provide that service uh, as well as they can that that's a good point actually and again it does because i'm quite sidetracked in everything that I'm trying to do and and speak to people all over the world and try and get some information and try mm -hmm. and get some interviews. I do get sidelined, you know, even my own children, I, I've got to admit. It is a thing that, you know, like I'm sure Youth Concern and, and so the other charities out there, they must obviously be getting quite a few phone calls with people who are just stressed at this time because mental health is a big thing and I can imagine it causing a few stress, especially on families at this time. Yeah, well, if a family particularly doesn't get on that well with each other and then they're forced to stay in the same space for longer periods of time, that adds to the stress and, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's potentially a, you know, a lot to think about and um, people are going to struggle with that. Uh, another one I'd like to mention, because I've been looking into this over the past few days, is... Um, is dementia. And the reason for that is that um, Aylesbury Town Council has kind of tried to be in the forefront of promoting dementia awareness throughout the town. Uh, we train what's called dementia champions that educate schools, colleges, businesses on the best and most effective ways to, to, to deal with situations when you're dealing with someone with dementia. And some of it's quite simple and straightforward, but it doesn't always occur to those of us who haven't got that issue. Um, how confusing life can be um, if you're living with dementia. And particularly now, routines are disrupted. People can't do what they want to do and go where they want to be. And, and uh, people can't have visits from relatives that sort of help to sort of anchor their memories because there's someone they're familiar with that they're seeing on a regular basis. So uh, the Alzheimer's Society I know are very busy with calls from people who are living with, looking after someone with dementia or maybe starting to worry about how things are affecting them and maybe their own memory, they're, they're a little bit concerned. So uh, the whole mental health world is is in overdrive at the moment and it's it's brought a focus on mental health issues that is probably long overdue um, and having mental health treated with the same seriousness as physical health you know is somewhere we should have been a long time ago but we are now starting to get there yeah uh, there's a lot of more money should be put into the system for mental health I think that's that's been said for the last few years and the dementia I mean we used to have a neighbor who had dementia and you know tried to help out and see what I could do and eventually it, it got a lot worse and mm -hmm. she was taken into care 
but uh, it must be very hard on on families who are dealing with people with dementia because obviously they're going to forget about um, what is actually going on and 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 not understand. Just like young children as well, I suppose they don't always understand what's going on. But with dementia, that's that's mm -hmm. a big thing. I, and I mean, one of the things I experienced with the dementia of my next door neighbour was her walking out and um, just up the road, and you know, having to go and actually bring her back because um, the care is oh I, I can't go after her. You're like, okay, then I'll go and get her because obviously she. she she's not aware of what she's doing um luckily i had a good rapport with her before it it became really severe so yeah very well mentioned i've got to admit that's that is something that does need to be you know um highlighted um obviously we can probably put a number up or or obviously just look it up on online and that can um direct people in the right way but you you're hearing a lot regarding that with dementia charities and are you yeah I am mental health generally um, but I think with dementia awareness week coming up later this month the town council would have been very much promoting that and I'd have been out and about attending events thanking carers and uh, you know awarding certificates to people who've passed their dementia awareness training um, so we're trying to highlight that in a slightly different way um, because it's still vitally important even though we can't achieve the, the sort of personal contact that, that we would have been normally aiming to do. Mm. Okay. Well, hopefully once the lockdown's finished, it's something that maybe the Elspeth Town Council, I don't know, can maybe move the times around or... Absolutely, yeah. yeah there's a lot of activities and events that we've been hoping to have over these few months that we would like to uh, to schedule in for later in the year if we can um, in particular fundraising events for youth concern that i planned to do i know that the people of the town have been very generous so far and i'm sure will have will have helped youth concern with some uh, you know, some substantial amounts uh, when that I think that figure might be announced later this month or the beginning of next month um, but if there's a chance to top up the coffers with a bit of extra towards the end of the year then I'll certainly be keen to do that okay so do, do, do youth concern get any money from the government or is it literally just solely on donations I think it's I'm not entirely certain but I think it's mainly from donations I don't know whether any of the local authorities or the government give them any direct help but um, that's not unusual there are many many charities that um, you think of as um, they must get some money from the government it's such an important thing surely they do but actually they don't and one of the prime examples there is hospices everyone thinks hospices are NHS funded in fact only a tiny proportion of their funding comes from the NHS it's nearly all donations and you think you know the, the wonderful care that hospices give and the time and the, the resource they have to put into not just giving the physical care but the understanding and dealing sympathetically with the people that go into hospices as well as their families um, that's tremendous work and it costs a lot of money that nearly all comes from voluntary donations so there's a lot of parts of this country that really are funded on charity and sometimes you think that doesn't feel right but it's it's wonderful that people are so generous to be able to to enable that to happen do you think after the coronavirus we need to seriously look at the way money is is used and abused in one way if you want if you want to take my aspect on it but things like hospices like you're saying um and uh, and youth concern and dementia there is so much about i mean everything you go uptown you go anywhere it's about people saying can you 
give us some money to this charity, that charity. Mm. It, do, it does make you think that why isn't enough money being given to obviously certain charities or they become part of the NHS or, or whatever. I don't know how they will do it. But with this virus, the amount of money that's been borrowed, I, I suppose, from the World Bank. Uh, again, I'm not really educated into that so I even looked mm. into and where does the World Bank get its money from it's, it's, it's an interesting one that when you start to dig around um, but what is going on I mean we a lot said about taxes people don't want to pay too much in taxes but they're probably affected by all the things that you've just talked about if you had family um, and obviously you've got older family and dementia oh, there's quite a lot that goes on that is not part of the ring fence money it goes into the nhs it it does what it does but how how this help does help people i mean the hospice take for instance um the nightingale hospice uh my, my friend's wife died um, of cancer and his daughter does this or did this uh charity event well, they've done um, dancing and I mean we live they said could we live stream it for them which we did we did it for, obviously for free and um, we did that because obviously we knew, knew her mum and my mates of wife but you know and, and they've done a great 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 um, great show shall I say but it does make you think all this money that's we're, we're now borrowing I mean we're talking billions of pounds but we've never borrowed billions of pounds or puts the taxes up to, to to pay for all these parts of society that does actually need proper funding. But it's left to charity. And I, I, I do think governments do sit there and go, well, actually, that could be dealt with by the public if they want to pay into doing it. And I don't think it's exactly right. And I, 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 really hope it, I mean, one of the things I said to, to, to Greg Smith was at the end of all this, Hopefully, people will understand spending more time with their family is very important. Um, and companies allow people to work from home more so that they can actually spend more time rather than traveling an hour to work and an hour back, especially if they work in London. I only use that as an example, but I'm sure up north, if they have to travel into Manchester or Birmingham, I mean, just driving through Birmingham, you know how busy it is. Um, and also up north. So, you know, and people jump on planes and have to go to meetings for an hour. Or two, mm -hmm. maybe that, that, that will change in post. There could be some really good things that come out of this in the future, such as, as you say, people working from home, not be, not needing to travel and clog up the roads or trains or buses, not have the stress of travelling. Uh, it could be good for companies because they, they wouldn't need to maintain large offices on a permanent basis. It gives people time and flexibility to spend more time with their families or meet their personal commitments rather than just being driven by work, work, work with everything else squeezed in around it as best they can. Um, so hopefully we won't return to exactly what we used to regard as normal in every way. We'll start to look afresh at things like that and say, well, we've shown we can work in a different way. Okay, it's it's not perfect, but things are getting done, um, and let's let's trust people to work that way, uh, and they'll probably be more productive as well as have happier, more balanced lives. Sounds good to me. Yeah, it sounds good, great to me. There is a thing. Have you have you been to Australia? Not yet. I have a I have a trip to Australia planned for October, but whether it's going to happen. Okay. Remains to be seen. This is, uh, I'll definitely say that. Whether or not the um, obviously flight company is still actually running, they've got a thing over there. So I, I went over there uh, years ago, and it. See, we live to work, but they work to live. That's how they, mm. they, they. And when you're over there, they do say, you know, us English, they say, you know, you, you pommies or whatever, you, you live to work. You don't work to live. And staying out there for a couple of months, I. I I got used to. I mean, most of them live around, around the out, you know, the outer of Australia. You know, ne next to the sea. Mm. You don't live inland. And it was interesting to, to to see how relaxed they are and how. God, I mean, I, I'd love to live there. <laughs> it's mm. it's one of those things where you just go, 
yeah we i mean that's how I, I i reassessed quite a few things in my life about after being out there for a few months it was interesting that and when you get back here and it was interesting my friend said to me when you get back martin because i'd been away for three months when you get back everything will be the same but everybody will think that it's different they will tell you the same stories they said when you left three months ago because it's all just part of the grind um so i found it very interesting that when i came back it's exactly what happened it was people telling me oh, i've done this i've done that i've done that and it was a bit like really they really you know work orientated and and don't get me wrong if you're going to do a job do it properly i mean hopefully i do a, a good enough job in what i do and you know trying to prove that fact but working 24 7 not seeing your family you know it, it's it, it's not mm-hmm. right and also there's a problem with obviously jobs and everything out there as well so it's like the retirement age has gone up to 70 isn't it i think i think it's 70 now mm-hmm. why you know what why are the older generation told that they must work an extra five years for retirement when there's not enough jobs out there it's it's a weird one you know if unemployment is up I mean especially now it's up but just intriguing we should be trying to make life yeah you work you earn money if anything retirement should be coming down so that we have a better <laughs> quality of life later on you know we don't just have to play golf then we can go sailing maybe that's another thing we can do yeah. but well for a long time we were being told that automation would take over everyone's jobs and our our big worry would be how to use all our leisure time but it does feel like we're working harder and longer hours and for a longer number of years so there's something in the balance of things that isn't quite right in all of that it's a good point about automation you are right we were supposed to be totally automated but is it a cost thing is it um I suppose your your major, for instance, I suppose building cars and planes and everything. Mm-hmm. That's probably more automated, isn't it? But I mean, Japan. Japan must be a more ultimate place to go to actually work out whether or not something can be automated. That's a, that's one of those countries on my list of places I must go. Is Japan? So um, that that interesting one. That automation. Mm-hmm. We'll see. We'll, we'll pick that up another time. There was one thing before I forget. Um, the 75th anniversary of VE Day coming up. Now, I know there was a few things Usby Town Council had down because they, they pop up in my diary and I go, no, that's been cancelled. Mm-hmm. Anything planned from the Usby Town Council? Well, the, uh, the, the day itself, the bank holiday is coming up this Friday, which is... Good point. Uh, it's not on a Monday. Holiday. So uh, we won't have to go to work or I'll, well I'll be <laughs> in the same place but not working um, but we are I am going to the uh, war memorial in the cemetery to lay a wreath um, because uh, it's important to to mark the uh, you know not just the celebration but the, the sacrifices that got us to that place of peace and safety in 1945. Uh, I know that um, people had originally planned to have street parties. Now there's a new twist on that where people are decorating their homes and going out onto their front drives and having their own sort of mini sort of outdoor street party at a distance and waving to their neighbours. I think there's a number of streets that are planning to do that and that's a great idea. That is fabulous. Because, I, did, uh, I didn't even have a clue. That's why I need, I did, this is why I need this catch up. If I didn't have this catch yeah. up, I wouldn't even know. That's that's a great I think idea. The, the stay at home street parties are, are becoming quite a thing. Right. Okay. All right then. That's. We'll have to popularise that one a bit, won't we? That's a. Hmm. So, so so what is it? Is it what they're just putting banners up and everything and. Yeah, banners, Union Jack bunting. I'm sure some people will. Um, dress up in 1945 costumes and um, go the whole hog. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, just some way of, of sort of marking that very important day with other people, 
but not with other people. Subject to the, the current rules, it's just sort of a way of, 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 of having that connection with people while you're uh, remembering. Do you know, I'm so glad we had this interview <laughs> because I would, never, I would never have thought about that. Never would have in a month of Sunday because I'm too busy trying to do a few other things. But that is very interesting to know. Is there anything else the Elsby Town Council might be doing? Obviously, you're laying the reef, which is obviously lovely. Um, is there going to be anything done uptown? Um, obviously, like closed door sort of thing. I don't know. I don't think it's possible under the current rules to have any sort of event that would potentially, you know, ideally, an event we would want it to be something that would attract people, but if it attracts people, then you've got social distancing issues, and is it a necessary journey to come into town for that purpose? So we are continuing to play it very, very safe, not have an event if there's, if there's any doubt whatsoever, which is still the position that we feel we're in and will be for a little while longer. Okay, that's good. I'm glad we got that cleared up, just in case people thought something might be going on in town, because people might obviously want to pay respects and obviously maybe mm -hmm. celebrate. But um, again, another thing we'll probably have to deal with after the lockdown. So it'll be it'll be interesting. Indeed. Hmm. Um, Martin, can I just mention one other thing that it's not something the town council as a body are doing, but I know many of our councillors are, um, and, and our, our staff members as well, are doing a lot of work on a voluntary basis, um, helping the NHS with transport, helping to manufacture and distribute PPE, uh, and a number of us are just phoning people in our communities where we've got contact details, particularly if we know people are older or living on their own, just a phone call to say, how are you doing? Is there any extra help you need? We can point you to all the services and all the groups that are out there. Um, some people just ask for a bit of shopping to be brought round. Others, um, all kinds of things come up. Um, yesterday, I phoned somebody who phoned me back today and said, I've got this problem. My drain's blocked in my bathroom sink. And he's a, a, a tenant of the housing trust, and he phoned them up and they said, well, we can come round in a week. And hmm. I can understand that, because they're going to be short-staffed as well, and they've probably got jobs that will be higher priority. And he said, all I probably need is, is you know, a bottle of that Mr. Muscle drain on blocker, but I can't leave the house because he's a vulnerable person. So I looked under my sink, and sure enough, I've got a bottle of it, three quarters full. So I whiz round, drop it on his doorstep. He just give me a call back two hours later. I've done it. It's worked. We've sorted my problem. And that's a very small thing to do, but it, it made a big difference to him. And so many people are doing just those small little favours. Or even you might find someone and they just want another human being to talk to. They haven't got any issues. They just fancy a, a chat and a bit of connection and company. And... As local councillors, we can't do our normal things like going around knocking on doors or putting leaflets through doors. So we're just trying to make our contact with people through the means we have at our disposal. And to a lot of people, that is making a bit of a difference. Is there a number they can um, There is, uh, it's right on, if you go on the Buckinghamshire Council you website, <laughs> it's right on, I'm sure it's right on their front page. Let's I've been reading it out to people all weekend long, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. Let's have a look, shall we? On their main page, is it? Let's I'm pretty see. sure it's... On the Buckinghamshire Council one, isn't it? Not the Asby Town Council. That's right, yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Can't see anything jumping out at me, but I'm a typical bloke, probably, if I can't see it in front of me. Um... It's got latest up local information. Let's click on there. That might be it. Oh, I, I, there's a 24 hour. I mean, it's not on their main page, but there is a number 01296. It says Buckinghamshire Council has a 24 hour phone number. 
set up specifically for calls relating to coronavirus only. This is the number to call if you have any concerns about an extremely vulnerable person. So 01296 383204. Or please use our okay. service centre number, which is 01296 395 Yeah, and I know that the, um, the Buckinghamshire Council are proactively phoning people back, some on a daily basis, some a couple of times a week, just to check in with them. Make sure they're all right. I think there's something like 1,200 vulnerable people getting that contact from the council on a regular basis, as well as many thousands of others who are getting the contact from volunteers or local councillors doing things off their own bats. Uh, just to make sure the community are aware that if they're struggling, there are sources of help, and yeah. they just need to reach out to try and find it, and we can. Uh, we can put that help in their direction. Some things we can just do ourselves with a you know, simple act of kindness. Others, we can get the experts and the specialists if the, uh, if the help needed is, is a bit more involved. Okay, well, I'll, I'll pass that information on. I'll see if I can whack something on my, my site and Twitter and God knows what else I update now. There's <laughs> just so much. Um, but yeah, the number 01296 395. Zero zero zero, which is their normal number, but the three eight oh one two nine six three eight three two oh four, I think that's a new one I've not seen before. So that's a special number for people who are vulnerable, struggling with coronavirus or self isolation issues, or they're worried about a friend or a neighbour and just want to know how can I get help for this person. Yeah, I, I do know there's a couple of old people I've spoke to. They they don't want to put me in the line of fire I think is, is the word I'd say even though I say I'm going to the shop is there anything that you need they say no they don't feel like they're vulnerable but then they've called back and said is there a number and I've said well if you need anything just let me know but it's interesting I, I will put it up there and I'll see what I can do it's an interesting one um, and it's really nice to know that there, there is something out there for for people who, who need this number because I I think I had a look around before, I couldn't really find anything that easy for them when they've asked me and people co comment and say stuff and it's quite interesting. So, well done again. You've been on, you, did you have your Weetabix today? You've done quite well. <laughs> You've done very well. Amazing. Is there, is there anything else you need to, to, to add? I don't think so at the moment. We always manage to cover a lot of ground, don't we, Martin? Um, and I'm sure by the time we speak again, there'll be all kinds of other new things we can talk about or, or go back to and developments um so yeah sorry god i've interrupted no no just saying really it's good to talk and uh and i hope people are finding these chats useful the, the take up isn't that mad I'll, I'll, I'll give it that way it's not like we've got a million people watching but i, I do think people who do watch do pass it on to other people and then they say something back to me it's quite interesting um what i've started to do is um is doing snippets because when people see like a long interview they do think oh have I got time to and I'll fit that in later and they don't so I've actually started doing snippets especially with the MP Greg Smith so obviously our time or your time is more more important than mine so to speak obviously because you're trying to do a mayor's job as well as your normal job um, same with Greg Smith he, he's doing quite a lot so do you hear that little ding that come through I do apologize if you heard that and also my cat's knocking on the, the window to come in by the way. <laughs> if that's what you can hear i've got it silent so i can't hear it maybe you do but um yeah these snippets are are quite quite good people are picking into mm -hmm. them i think because it's a certain specific thing that they're that, that they're interested in and um so i do hope those snippets and I'll, I'll do a little snippet of that and i'll put some little jazzy stuff in with a, a phone number and i'll put that I, I create a little front screen as well you know a little um picture that goes on what people can click on so that'll have the number on there as well so if i if yeah, i put anything the, anything that makes it a little bit more sexy and exciting rather than just an hour of me droning on i'm sure well, <laughs> well it's got my face on there so i'm unfortunate it's not going to be sexy but yours is on there so i'm sure that'll be better so if i just put the thing on me it might attract more people that way <laughs> so mm -hmm. mr mayor mike smith of the Ellsbury Town Council. Um, I thank you for your time once again. Stay safe. And thank you. Um, hopefully um, you'll have a face mask next time. <laughs> I'll 
I shall, I shall get that work underway to st and I'll, I'll try and make it as attractive as the ones that you've come up with. Uh, I've got a printing, clothes printing thing, so I did cheat a bit, to be fair. I was able no. to print mine. But um, thank you once again. Stay safe, and we'll catch you again, maybe in a week's time. Cheers. Bye, Bye for now.